Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Of all the rank organisation starlets, Belinda Lee stands out as the most notorious, yet paradoxically anonymous, British actress of the 1950s. At the 1955 Cannes Film Festival, she led ranks glitterati during the studio's uncharacteristic attempt to generate British cinema glitz. This may well have prompted Diana Dawes' outrageous mink bikini at the same event, a barely concealed method of stealing back the limelight. But while Dawes remained in the public eye well beyond her cinematic heyday, Lee's fame died with the car crash that killed her at the age of 25. How Belinda Lee became the new Diana Dawes Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Belinda Lee, The Forgotten Bombshell Belinda Lee was an outsider seduced by the Italian film industry, highlighting the allure of its uncensored passion. The British rank organisation Starlet from Budley Salterton, only 15 miles south of Exeter, left behind the wholesome roles offered at home for more sensual parts in Italian films. In England, Belinda Lee had never really been allowed to break from the on-screen image of a privileged but naive young woman. When she moved to Italy, her scandalous private life seemed to match the scandalous roles she played. Not only was she seduced by the sexual liberation she was given on screen, but she began an affair with an Italian aristocrat, Prince Filippo Orsini. They entered into a suicide pact, which they did not go through with, but which made Belinda Lee into a European celebrity. In 1958 she was dropped by rank organisation, but the scandal worked to her advantage. She was offered many more risque roles, showing how her private life was being used to define her on-screen persona. The fact that Belinda Lee had lost fame in Britain by the time of her death in 1961 shows the divide between British and continental film at the time. In the issue of Picture Goer from 5th of December 1959, there is a section on the cover girl which discusses Belinda Lee. Our cover picture reminds you of the beauty that is Belinda, of the beauty that we are not likely to see on British screens for a long time to come. For what a transformation in the curvy blonde Belinda Lee who was, at one time, one of our top glamour girls. Quitting this country, the rank organisation and cameraman husband Cornell Lucas for the delights of Rome, Miss Lee is now an Italian accented beauty living quietly on the continent. So Belinda Lee was the British starlet who became mesmerised by Italian cinema, and in this way I felt like I could relate to her. Diana Dawes' fame probably outstripped her actual value as a movie star, and she would have been all too aware that there were a number of other pretty young girls around as competition. There was one new kid on the block in particular, four years younger and with an even better connected husband. Her name was Belinda Lee. Lee was born in 1935 in Budley Salterton, a small town in East Devon. Her family had money, Dad owned a hotel, and Belinda, like many middle-class girls of the time, went to boarding school. She later called herself a spoilt only child, and said she had a strict and very ladylike upbringing. Lee had wanted to act ever since she was nine. Her parents were not enthusiastic, but Belinda persisted, and she was allowed to appear in various amateur productions. Lee's rise to fame was far more rapid than Dawes. She won a scholarship to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London. While appearing in a production, she was spotted by agents who recommended her to writer-director Val Guest, who was casting a new comedy, The Runaway Bus. Val Guest was struggling to cast a key support role, a blonde passenger on the bus of the title who loves mystery novels. He was impressed with Lee's screen test and gave her the part. Watching the movie today, Lee is gorgeous to look at and is quite funny. The film did not turn Howard into a film star, but it is entertaining. There were plenty of jobs going in British cinema at the time for pretty blondes with a bit of spark, particularly in B-movies. Lee had support roles in Meet Mr. Callaghan and Life with the Lions. Lee's public profile was raised even further by a series of glamorous portraits taken of her by Cornell Lucas, 
the leading stills photographer of the day. The two hit it off romantically as well, and they were married. Lee was 19 years old when she first wed. Lucas was 14 years her senior. She was promoted to leading parts in just her fourth movie, Murder by Proxy, which was a thriller made by Hammer Films with director Terence Fisher, starring a fading American leading man, in this case Dane Clark. It's an entirely decent, unpretentious film noir. The age gap between the leads is annoying, but Lee is an ideal femme fatale, or isn't she? The industry noticed and Lee graduated to A Pictures with a small part in The Bells of St Trinian's, a comedy about a riotous girls' boarding school from Frank Launder. Lee played a door-style student sent to seduce a jockey to get inside information, the only one of the females in the movie to be truly sexualised. Often cast in demure roles in her early career, she was able to demonstrate her dramatic abilities. However, she found more constant employment when she began to play sexpot roles, typecast as one of several sensual blondes. Lee then played the second lead in Footsteps in the Fog, an entertaining medium-budget gothic thriller starring Stuart Granger and Gene Simmons, directed by Arthur Lubin, for Columbia. She also had the female lead in a low-budget comedy, No Smoking, an attempt to turn another stage comic, in this case Reg Dixon, into Norman Wisdom. Duly impressed, the rank organisation signed Lee to a long-term contract. As she was under 21, her husband had to co-sign. There was some press at the time that Lee was going to be a rival to Diana Dawes. A rival to Dawes, you ask? The star of Is Your Honeymoon Really Necessary? What had happened? Three words. Women in prison. Dawes's career had been rejuvenated through her performance in a prison drama, The Weak and the Wicked. The movie, a rare female-oriented story from 50s British cinema, was excellently done and became a big hit, earning Dawes excellent reviews and new status within the industry. Dawes had every reason to believe that she was finally established as a movie star, and why not? She was one of the most famous people in England, she was beautiful and could act, she was coming off not one but three hit films, she was popular with audiences and press agents, she was definitely confident enough to turn down an offer to play the female lead in a comedy for rank, the big money. She was replaced in the film by another blonde, Belinda Lee. Most pretty female actors under contract to rank had to spend at least some time as a straight woman to their comedy stars. The Big Money with Ian Carmichael was one of three straight banana parts Belinda Lee made for the studio. In fairness, Lee had a decentish role in all three. The other main type of role played by female stars at rank were sensible gals. Characters with names like Molly and Jane, who were no nonsense but kind, not overly glamorous, ideal girlfriend types. Lee played three of these in The Feminine Touch, she was one of four nursing students romancing Dr. George Baker. In Eyewitness, a thriller directed by Muriel Box, she was a nurse threatened by a killer. And in The Secret Place, a crime drama which was the directorial debut of Clive Donner. She was a kiosk attendant whose boyfriend commits a heist of which Lee disapproves. None of these films were particularly popular, but Rank had faith in Lee and gave her the female lead. Note that qualification, female lead, in two of their most prestigious movies, Miracle in Soho. Who knows what might have become of Belinda Lee? The 1950s were a good time to be a beautiful blonde, and by the end of the decade her career was on the rise. At the end of 1957, British exhibitors voted Belinda Lee the tenth most popular British film star at the box office. Like Dawes, she was the only woman. Out of interest, ahead of her were Dirk Bogard, Kenneth Moore, Peter Finch, John Gregson, Norman Wisdom, John Mills, Stanley Baker, Ian Carmichael and Jack Hawkins. Belinda Lee had essentially replaced Diana Dawes as the biggest female star in British films. That wasn't the only time she rubbed up against Dawes. 1957 was a big year for Lee. It was the year of her first Italian film and the year of a major scandal. Though she was only in her early twenties, she was married, and so was her Italian lover, and he was a papal prince. 
The suicide attempts, both subsequently made early in 1958, were followed by Lee losing her contract with Rank and her lover's family losing their hereditary title. That wasn't enough to end her career, though. Lee moved to Europe and made more films in Italy and France. Dawes made the film in Rome at the same time another English starlet was working in town, Belinda Lee. While Dawes' Italian sojourn was just another gig for her, Lee's visit would fundamentally change that actor's life. Lee had been offered the title role in The Goddess of Love, which cast her as the model for the original statue of Aphrodite. Lee apparently got the part after impressing Italian film directors at the Cannes Film Festival by going for a swim and losing the top of her bikini. That's what they said. Lee spent a lot of the film posing with a bare back and walking around in short togas. Much of her time off-camera was spent having an extramarital affair with Prince Filippo Orsini, a handsome war hero, a prince descended from one of Italy's most distinguished families. He was prince assistant to the papal throne. Married to a woman whose wealth propped up said family's impoverished finances and who he constantly cheated on. Orsini met Lee on a beach. He lied that there were sharks in the water. She was impressed and the two of them began a not terribly discreet affair. Lee later claimed, I changed the day I got to Rome. One day I was a quiet English girl, the next I was a woman. What a time I had and how the Italian men love us actresses. When she returned to England, she ended her marriage to Lucas, although the press did not report or seen his involvement. Yet. Rank gave Lee top billing in her next movie, Nor the Moon by Night. Joy Packer, author of the novel on which the film was loosely based, met the star on location, describing her as such. Her hips were a little too big and her legs not quite enough for true grace but what one noted was the beauty of her green cat-titled eyes, her mane of red-gold hair and the young firm contours of her throat and bosom. She was quiet and composed, easy to talk to, with a sleepy, well-educated voice. She had a way of tossing her hair constantly, as if she could not forget it. She was unaware of Africa, unaware of her surroundings or her job, except when she was actually performing. People said that she was unapproachable. Perhaps she was because she was wrapped in the shining cocoon of an illicit love affair. Her heart and soul were in Rome with her forbidden lover. During filming, Lee told a reporter that she wanted to play passionate, exotic parts. I don't want to be the girl next door or somebody's sister. I don't really like being a simple outdoor girl either. Good at heart, even when she's swept off her feet. Lee would get her wish. It's unlikely she would have predicted how it would happen. During a break in filming, Lee returned to Italy to see Orsini, who told her he was not going to leave his wife or money for Lee. The actor responded by trying to commit suicide through an overdose of sleeping pills. She did not succeed, but wound up spending several days in hospital. Not to be outdone, Orsini overdosed on pills and slashed his wrists. He too was unsuccessful and taken to hospital. Orsini later claimed in his memoirs that he did not try to commit suicide, arguing he had just gotten drunk and slashed his wrists to show a maid he was not afraid of physical pain, an explanation which sounds so absurd one is tempted to believe it is true. Both incidents were all over the papers, becoming a leading scandal of 1958, at least in Europe where people had actually heard of Orsini and Lee. Orsini's wife kicked him out and cut him off and his family lost its hereditary title of Prince Assistant to the Papal Throne. The Pope made a sermon condemning adultery and suicide, which was commonly interpreted as being a reference to the couple. Lee recovered sufficiently to return to South Africa and complete Nor the Moon by Night. There was more publicity when she was essentially smuggled into the country to avoid the local press. She eventually went home to London, telling the press, I feel as if I have just come out of prison. I'm 22 and hope to marry again before I'm 80. Love is the important thing. I believe in letting my heart rule my head. She and Cornell Lucas were divorced. Lucas eventually married another starlet, Susan Travers, who was even younger than Lee. Rank seemed unsure what to do with Lee. Well-publicised adulterous affairs can increase an actor's popularity. However, in the British film industry of the 1950s, which liked its women sensible and or straight bananas, it seemed to scare producers. 
She would not need that permission much longer. In October 1958, Rank announced that they would not pick up its option on Lee's contract at the end of the year. This was commonly interpreted as her being fired due to the Orsini scandal. Lee decided to relocate permanently to Europe. She threw aside her career for second-rate Italian movies, Terrace Amours and Fast Italian Cars. There was an element of truth to that, particularly the fast cars bit, as we shall see, but it wasn't the whole story. For one thing, Lee's career until then had mostly been in second-rate British films, and there had been no indication this would change. Also, she made films in France and Germany as well as Italy, and some of the Italian movies she made were excellent. She wound up appearing in 12 European movies in a little over two years. Now all the time I make films, she said in June 1959, one after the other. It won't last, but now I am in demand. I might as well cash in on it. The studio was keen to raise her profile, but struggled with its direction. Despite Glamour Girl publicity shots highlighting her undoubted beauty, her first dramatic roles were of wholesome but naive young women, creating a star profile that was at once compassionate and understanding, yet containing a frank sexuality. Miscasting often blighted the promise of this persona, her performances never really breaking from her privileged Budley Salterton upbringing. Remarkably, her persona drama worked to Lee's advantage. Avoiding the complete obscurity suffered by many rank starlets, the European film industry offered her a range of riskier roles that played on her previously contained sensuality. She was almost always cast as a desired or active woman, adulterous wives, movie stars, etc. Sometimes her characters were punished for transgressions, but most of the time they were allowed to live, and pretty much every role she played in a European movie was more complex, varied and interesting, and better photographed than her British movies. Always I am asked now to play wicked women, Lee said. On the continent, I'm thought of always in the connection with parts like that. Bit of a change from the old rank orgy, organisation we think she meant. But I'm not ambitious anymore, I don't care anymore to be a big star. I used to be so ambitious, now it means nothing to me. Now I just wanted to make some money, so I can live the way I want to. Lee found a new beau in documentary director Gualtiero Giacopetti, famed for making Mondo Kane, the first of the Mondo movies. In 1961, Lee decided to take some time off from acting and accompanied Gualtiero Giacopetti and another director, Paolo Cavara, around the world to shoot footage for a documentary. She joined them in Hong Kong, then visited Tahiti, Hawaii, Los Angeles and Las Vegas. On the 13th of March 1961, Lee, Giacopetti, Cavara and their USA contact, Nino Falenga, were travelling in a station wagon from Las Vegas to Los Angeles on Highway 91. The plan was for the filmmakers to return to Rome, then go on to New York, where they would shoot the remaining quarter of the movie. Falenga was driving the car, which was going 100 miles an hour just outside the town of San Bernardino, when the rear tyre blew causing the vehicle to skid for 1,100 feet, leap a ditch and land upside down. Lee was thrown 63 feet from the car, suffering a skull fracture and broken neck. A doctor who stopped at the site pronounced her dead before the ambulance arrived. Lee's co-passengers all survived. Whereas other rank starlets had something of a shelf life, these meteor rolls meant her starlight wasn't fading. With her high cheekbones and strong profile, hers was a beauty that would have aged well. But at the time of her death in 1961, she was already a fading memory in her native country, with many of her late films failing to get British distribution. It is difficult to say whether this cut short a promising career, since she was reportedly losing interest in acting at the time of her death. Nevertheless, the films that constitute her legacy are an intriguing mix of prestige and tat, ambition and failure, revealing the grittier side of the glamour of studio filmmaking as it began its long decline. Belinda Lee was buried in Rome, the city where she had had so many of her great adventures. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Belinda Lee's life sadly ended early. Carol Landis is also one of those actresses we lost too soon. 
Watch this video and find out, could Rex Harrison have saved Carol Landis's life?